to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. Uh, I think this is uh, one of the most profound passages, or actually we get down to the verse I'm talking about in the Bible. Uh, it, I think after last week's message, uh, I need to bring this one. And uh, I have preached it before. It's been four or five years. But it's called Before You Panic. Before You Panic. Because I think last week I may have panicked some of you. Um, it was about our nation and the direction we're going. And um, we didn't even put it on YouTube. We figured it might get pulled. We might get our channel pulled. But um, I, I said a lot of things there that nations have gone this route before. We have examples of it in history of uh, nations that have, well, none's been as free as this nation's been for a long, long time, and uh, maybe not afterwards for a long time, maybe till the Lord comes. But um, it's uh, it's frustrating. It's uh, there's a lot of anxiety uh, about what's going on, and so I think I think this message is needed. Uh, because I've even turned uh, turned off a lot of the news because all it does is amp me up. This keeps amping me up, amping me up, you know, and you're just like, it, you can't believe what's happened. Uh, you can't believe that it was allowed to happen. And um, this may set your mind at ease. John chapter 19, starting at verse 1, he says, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers platted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. They smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests therefore and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews, the Jews answered, We have a law. Answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. And went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? Now there's the, there's the question. Not who are you, but whence art thou? <laughs> and he said, uh, But Jesus gave him no answer. That irritated Pilate. So Pilate says this in verse 10, But then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? And then this profound statement, And Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, bless the message now. May we see, Father, that even in all this chaos, even in all this corruption, Lord, it's the power of God, and that's power that you've given them, Lord, and nothing's happening that you don't know about. Nothing's happening out of your control, and we as Christians can rest in you and have peace in you, knowing, Father, that if this thing be of God, then so be it. And Father, I pray, just bless the message now, comfort hearts, I ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, what he's saying there is that all powers of God... Now, you know, when you read... And we talked about this over in um, First Corinth, or Romans chapter 13, verse 1, that let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power of God, but the powers that be ordained of God. And we, we mentioned that last week, talked about that last week. Well, that power was to do good. It said it might be um, um, to execute uh, wrath upon evildoers. That's what God created law for, for unlawful people, for sinful people. And these laws were to keep people in line, and he gave power to people to execute those laws. But what we see here is the power gets corrupted. And God has allowed that power to get corrupted, and um, because he has allowed it, it's still the power of God. In other words, we don't need to be afraid of it just because they corrupted the power, and they're not doing right by it. In other words, when Jesus Christ is before Pilate, they're getting ready to crucify him. He says, you could have no power. It's the one who didn't bust out laughing. You could have no power at all except it come from above. What you're doing right now is because God gives you that power and allows you to keep that power and allows you to execute that power. You need to feel the same way about your government. 
They only have that power because God lets them have that power and lets them do what they're doing right now. That tells me, okay, Lord, if you're in on this thing, if you're allowing this thing to unfold like it's going to... I mean, he allowed the crucifixion to unfold, didn't he? Could he have stopped it? He could have dropped Pilate dead right there on the spot if he wanted to. He, in fact, 12 legions of angels could have showed up and wiped them all out. That's what Jesus said. He had power to call down 12 legions of angels, but didn't. And this is the thing. Christian, you're not a victim. Just as Jesus Christ was not a victim, you're a victor. Jesus Christ, is what He is about to do is make us all victorious in Christ Jesus. So we're victors. We've already got this thing won. Now, if some bad times roll out, if some rough times, if some bumpy road rolls out, that's fine. If it's of God, take it like it's of God. So the thing to do is not to panic. There's no reason to panic because an omniscient, omnipotent, uh, omnipresent God has this whole thing under control. It's going exactly the way He wants it to. I've told you that I, it's been surprising to me for the last 10 years that God hasn't brought the, uh, judgment upon this nation sooner. So we shouldn't be surprised of what's happening now. So before you panic, at least ponder that it's the power of God. Just ponder it. Don't panic, just ponder it. Uh, God, God does not control the free will of man, but He does control the power of man. Now, he, does, he doesn't control the choice you make, that's because you have free will. But all the power is His. Whether you think so, it doesn't matter whether Joe Biden or the Congress, or it doesn't matter whether they believe that or not, it's still so. In Psalm 75, 7 it says, But God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. But look at Daniel chapter 4, verse 17. This one kind of says it all of what I'm getting at. Daniel 4, 17. It says, This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. Does that sound like about now? <laughs> The base individuals have the power, but God set it up so. You say, why? Well, so He can judge the nation. I mean, you think this is not going to hurt folks? It's going to hurt a lot of folks. It's going to change the way we do business. It's going to change the way we look at America. It's going to change the way you look at everything. But that's part of it. But, you know, who can prepare a table for you in the wilderness? God can. So what you need to do is just say, well, Lord... I know this is happening. I don't like it, but I'll trust you with it. And we just go on down the road just like we always have. Uh, we, are, we, are a, we are a family. We will take care of one another. So before you panic, at least ponder that is the power of God. Before, and I'm going to have to go through these pretty quick because I found 13 of them. Uh, before you explode, exercise some faith. I mean, exercise just a little faith in realizing that you know, God says this is possible, that He would allow this, and I can trust Him with it. Luke 17, 6 says, The Lord said, If ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto this sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. So what He's telling you is a little faith goes a long way. So before you explode, exercise some faith. Before you go to pieces, go to prayer. Go to prayer. Um... Spend a little time in prayer and things will look different when you get, when you get up from praying. Philippians 4, 6 says, be careful for nothing. That means don't be full of care about something. Don't, let something. don't let something give you an ulcer or give you so much anxiety you can't sleep at night. You know what? If you can't sleep at night because of anxiety, you need to get on your knees and give God that stuff. Amen. Just lay it on Him. He's got big shoulders. He can handle it. And just say, Lord, I can't take it. You take it. I don't want Him to think about it. The Lord says, just go to bed then. I'll think about it while you're sleeping. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. You know, God's been good to me so far. I'm just going to keep thanking Him for every day. I and mean, we thank Him this morning. We were able to have church. There was nobody barring the door, chaining up the... It wouldn't matter if they chained it. We'll just go somewhere else. You know, We don't need a building. Although that snow out there does look a little cold. 
stress warm. Over where I mean, we got used to that. It could be freezing, man. I mean, you'd be in, you didn't know what we was going to get. It's either 100 degrees in the church or zero. I don't think they had a happy medium over there. <coughs> um, the Lord said, before you come apart, uh, Jesus said, come apart for a while, you know. In Mark 6, 31, he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart unto a desert place, and rest a while. For there uh, were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. They didn't have time to even eat, hardly. And sometimes the Lord says, Hey, come apart before you come apart. Just know you, that that may be necessary for you just kind of turn off the TV, you know, shut down the phone, and spend some time just doing nothing but enjoying your family, or uh, enjoying your Bible and having prayer time. And you'll, you'll be amazed how the Lord just take all that stuff and just kind of take it away. Can you change it? Can anybody in here change? Don't you think, they, didn't we try to change it? Didn't you, did you vote? It's in God's hands. It's in God's hands at that point. Um, before you quit, quote some scripture. Amen? It can't hurt. It's what Jesus did, right? I mean, he spent a day with the devil himself. <laughs> you haven't had that bad of a day yet. Uh, Matthew 4, 1-4, to And then Jesus led up in the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, you know, that's a long time to fast. Four days, about, I mean, you think you fasted. Try three days. Let me know how you, how you did it, okay? Now, I've done four or five when I was younger. I don't know that I could do that today. Uh, it's something to be able to fast that long. And uh, you'll, have, you'll, have a spiritual, uh, you'll have a spiritual high after that you'll, you'll never be able to match. I can't tell you why except for you've just you've submitted the flesh. Because after about three, or three days, that flesh is ready to give up. You have starved it. And it seems like you have this control for a while. I mean, the flesh will, you know, rear its ugly head later. But it seems like for months... It could even be a year. I mean, you just seem like you just have this ability to, to, to uh, overcome all the, the things of the flesh. And that's why fasting is such a good thing. Um, it can be, some of you it might not be good uh, medically. That's another reason. But um, for those of you that can, even a couple day fast. But boy, I'll tell you what, in just in two days, your flesh will be screaming at you. Feed me. You'll know how much power it has over, uh, over you. Uh, I, there's many a fast that I quit right in the middle of it, didn't get it finished. Some I did. Uh, because, and then I realized, oh, I'm not as strong as I think I am. I don't have any say-so over this body like I think I do. And a lot of times, it's dictating to me exactly what I do when I do it. It's hungry, I go feed it. Okay? Uh, and when the tempter came to me, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And he answered and said, It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And a lot of what he's quoting, I think is out of Deuteronomy 6. I'm just, I think it might be. But uh, he's quoting scripture to the devil. So before you quit, quote some scripture. I mean, if you're going to throw in the towel, at least quote a few verses. Amen? Might change your mind. Might quote the verse you need <laughs> right at that point. Um, you may not have any power of your own, but you're on the side of him who has all power in heaven and earth. You need to remember that. Before you leap, look to the Savior. Uh, he's the beginning of the end, the first and the last, the author and finisher of our faith. That's what Hebrews 12 says. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set uh, down at the right hand of the throne of God. Sometimes we just real, need to realize that suffering does come along. It does. And we endure that suffering. But we, we, we realize that our Savior endured suffering as an example, and we're to endure it too. But before you leap, look to Him. You know, it's one thing, when you, we talk about looking into Jesus, it's like, it's, uh, if you look at everything in front of you, it can be extremely disturbing. But when you look afar, when you look at the end of that thing, when you look at the, the Scriptures, it gives you a hope. And... A lot of times that's all you need, just that to remind you of that hope that you have. It doesn't matter how belly up this thing goes. It doesn't even matter. Not to us. So before you leave, look to the Savior. Before you let go, let God. 
And these are just little quips. Before you let go, let God. And the, the Bible says in Psalm 68, verse 1 to 3, Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As, as wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. Why? Because we know who's going to wind up the victor in all this. Listen, whatever vengeance we give to God against, I am telling you, He will execute it all. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. He didn't say I'd forgive it. He said I'll repay it. And God can repay vengeance much more than you can. See, that's the reason you want people to get saved. Because Jesus Christ took that vengeance that was against us. But Brother, what's left out here in this world, when he comes back, you haven't seen vengeance in your life. You just go ahead and start reading through that book and see what it says. It'll scare you half to death. Because he's talking about some severe vengeance. But before you let go, just let God. Let God have it. Let God take care of it. Now, I know all these things are easier said than done. The minute you walk out of here, you know, you think you're walking out of... Listen, this Bible is reality. It can be your reality. But you just have to believe it and trust it. Just a little faith. You know, sometimes you just have to claim things. Just claim it. And if you'll do that, uh, you'll get through the worst of times. Um, before you hold up in a cave, hold fast. Some of you are already thinking about moving to Kentucky somewhere. I was just kidding, but I was thinking about it. Wouldn't anybody nobody else? Up. I'm thinking about all the mammoth caves, you know, and, and staking out my own uh, cave there, you know. And uh, you, you think, well, if, we, if I go and just rough it in the wilderness, then something else gets you. I, I mean, I know that if I w went to Alaska in, in the middle of nowhere, I'd probably chop down a tree and fall on me, you know. Or I'd get attacked by something, you know, beaver or something just goes after me. <laughs> you know, wolf, a wolf catches me out and I ain't got my gun, you know, or something like that. Um, I mean, you think, you, you, you're, not, you're not safe in this world anywhere. There's always something that can get you. But as long as God knows where I'm at. Um, I'll forget about it. There's a quote I can't remember. Hebrews 4.14 says, Seeing then that we have a, a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. And then uh, Hebrews 10.23 says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. I mean, you know, if you, if you can believe him in the good times now, God's going to test you, see if you'll believe him in the bad times. Still believe he can take care of you? Still believe that he's omniscient, om omnipresent? All, believe he's all-powerful? Well, we'll see. Sometimes this world starts putting doubts. Listen, it's the true test of faith. The true test of faith is when it's under fire. When it's under pressure. Revelation 2.25 says, But that which, we, we, uh, that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. All we got to do is hold on till he comes. Okay? And I, I don't think that's that far away. But you say, well, I don't think I can hold on. Well, can you hold on for another week? Can you hold on for one more week? How about one more day? How about another hour? Hey, if it gets right down to it, how about for just one more minute? And then can you hold on for another minute? And maybe you hold on for another five minutes? I mean, sometimes it gets down to where you're just trusting God for every minute of the day. And we're past weeks, man. We're down to minutes. But he says, hold fast. Hold fast. Before you give up, look up. Thy redemption draweth nigh. He said um, in Luke 21, 28, And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemp redemption draweth nigh. You know, preachers have been preaching for last 300 years of what should happen in the last days and how it's going to deteriorate and men will be lovers of themselves and uh, boastful and proud and uh, truce breakers and all this stuff. I mean, it's all in there. Paul talked about it. Perilous times shall come. Now when it happens, we're all shocked. No, it's just... It's going to fall out just like the Bible says. And because of that, we need to look up. Because it just means it's getting closer. Because he said, the latter days, the latter times. It's just getting closer. We might be out of here in the spring. Can you, can you, can you last five more months, maybe? 
Can you? I plan on making it. If I got to claw my way to this spring, I, you never know. Lord, Lord, come back. Boom, we're out of here. It's over with. 1 John 3, 1 to 3, Behold what manner of love the Father bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And every man that hath this hope in Him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. It's a purifying, sustaining hope, knowing that the Lord is coming. And you know, we're going to, get, we're going to finally drop these bodies. I'm ready to drop this thing. Um, done with it, ready for it to be changed and immortal. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I think I'm more fearful growing old uh, than facing perilous times uh, if I knew the Lord was coming. It just seemed like growing old just seemed like it's just so long drawn out with so many things going wrong with you. I don't see any, I don't see any pleasure in that. I don't see any joy in that necessarily. I think the Lord will get you through no matter which way you go. But I'm much happier thinking, okay, we've got to go through some rough times, then the Lord comes back. I'm good with that. I've always been good with that. Um, before, you, uh, before you bow out, at least bow down one more time. In Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 5 and 6, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, uh, with lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Uh, that is, you know, I mean, listen, if it's all done, you know, I mean, give it one more, give the Lord one more, praise the Lord. One more bow the head and worship. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's, 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 it's um, the day when they're going to get thrown into the fiery furnace. And they're thinking, well, O king, whether God delivers us or, delivers us or not, we're, we're not going to bow down to you. Now, we'll bow down to him, but we're not going to bow down to you. So they throw him in the fiery furnace. And you'd think, you know, and this is just one of those things where God shows deliverance. And they're in the midst of that furnace, and one like the Son of God's in there with them. There's four of them in there. Did we not cast in three? <laughs> There's somebody in there with it. Do you know that whatever you're going through, God's in there with you? Because he's inside you. I mean, you got it better than Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He may have been in the fiery furnace, but he's inside you. There's nothing that's going to happen to you God doesn't know about. There's nothing that's going to happen to you that God isn't helping you get through it. So, before you go down for the count, um, here's the next. Before you go down for the count, can you count it all joy first? Can you at least crack a smile and tell the Lord that it has been good? I can. I mean, I, I'd, I'd feel guilty if I didn't. Uh, James 1, 2 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse, uh, diverse temptations. Diverse temptations. Different temptations. Count it all joy. That's probably not the easiest thing to do. 2 Corinthians 12, 8 to 10 says, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul had a problem. And it was such a problem, it just it bothered him all the time. And he, he said, Lord, I need you to take this away from me. And he asked three times. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient. Sometimes God's not taking it. Sometimes God's just not going to take that thing away. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul says this, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. The weaker you are, the more powerful God is. Because the more you have to rely on Him, the more He is reliable. <laughs> I mean, when you, when, when, you give, when, you, when you give it to God, God takes it. It's when you think you can do it on your own, or you have to get by on your own. That's when, you're, that's when you got trouble. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. So, the other thing is that, you know, what you need, well, you probably won't get it from God until you need it, right? I mean, when you need more grace, you'll get it from God when, you, when, when that more, more grace is needed. In other words, God, God will be there when you need Him to be there. Sometimes we want Him to show up right now. You know, give it to me now. Well, you don't need it right now. But when you do need it, it'll be there. I think, um, 
I think one of the things the Lord gives you, and this you can find this throughout the scriptures, is a boldness. You know, I mean, if you think about all the scary things out there, well, can I tell you a secret? There's nothing scarier than God. And if you've been through this book, you know that. So before you let them scare you half to death, the one that wrote this book, he's much scarier. Um, but I think, I think when you, you need him, he'll be there. And I think because you have a fear of the Lord, you have less, I'm not going to say no fear of man. To say that we walk around with no fear, I wish it was so. This flesh is cowardly. Um, but I believe with the time you need that boldness and that courage, I believe, that, I believe it'll come from God. I believe it'll be there for you. Um, just count it all joy. Before you tap out, know that it's probably a test. God will test your faith. Um, what you believe about Him every single day, and especially those times of trial, the trials that you go through, it's just God testing you. You know, just see if you'll, you'll hang in there. See if you'll believe Him. See if you'll trust Him. Listen, if he never did that, he'd never know, he'd never be able to show you the level of faith that you're at. If, he, if, if nothing ever went wrong, if nothing ever went bad, then how would you know what? Anybody can serve God, you know, they got plenty of money in the bank and they got their health. I mean, it's easy to serve God when you got all that, but how about when you don't have it? How about if you find yourself in a jail cell? Still going to have the same praise on your lips? Song in your heart? You know, just, you know, that... If I wound up in jail because of my own doing, okay, I need to suffer that. But if I wind up in jail because of God, the Bible says you ought to be happy about that. You ought to be happy about it. Why? That you're kind of worthy to suffer for His namesake. God doesn't, you, you think that, oh, God's going to put me through. No, he may not put you through anything because you might not be worthy of it. You've got to be counted worthy to suffer for his namesake. That'll take some faith on your part. Um, 1 Peter 4, 12 to 13. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice in as much as you're, uh, that you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when His glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Because you're going to get in on that. You're going to get in on that glory. He's going to share that glory with you because you too suffered for His namesake, just as He suffered for the Father's sake. Psalm 17.3 says, Thou hast proved mine heart, thou hast visited me in the night, Thou hast tried me and shalt find nothing. I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. Boy, did somebody did some soul searching in that verse. A purpose that their mouth would not transgress. Psalm 66.10, For thou, O Lord, hast proved us, thou hast tried us as silver is tried. Silver is tried with heat. You put it under heat, and you'll be tried. God will put you under some heat. And to see, what he can, uh, to see what He can do with you. Psalm 1830. As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all that trust in Him. The word of the Lord. We talked to, he talked about the word in Sunday school. The word of the Lord is tried. Or you, can, you can read that as Jesus Christ was tried. Everybody gets it. Even the Son of God got tried. Now He came through the thing picture perfect. I don't think we do, but I know this. I'll tell you what, I've read um, Fox's Book of Martyrs through a couple times. I've always gone back and referenced some of those things and, and what those men went through, uh, and women, <laughs> even some children. Uh, you, you, when you're reading, you just can't believe people can think of such evil things to do to another person. I mean, who thinks these things up? They're just wicked beyond belief. And there were some men that, you know, when they, they, I mean, they were burning them alive, man. I mean, they just, they, they called them faggots, uh, the wood, you know, fuel for a fire. And they would pile them up against these men and they were tied up and they'd give them one more chance to deny their faith. And then they lit them on fire. 
And there, there were some men that, man, that they, they couldn't take it. They recanted. So they take them down, you know, and uh, uh, they think about it a while, and then they recant their recantation. You know, they'd say, well, I made a mistake, and then they'd go to the fire. And sometimes, you know, the Lord just got to show you, you know, just that you can, you can do it. You can, I mean, if those men can do it, we can do it. Um, there, were situations, there was one situation you read about where uh, a man in the crowd uh, asked the man, he said, uh, raise your hand if you don't feel it. Raise your hand if God helps you endure it. And this guy just burned away like a Roman candle. And before he expired, whew, the hand, of course, the hands, all the ropes burned away. He throws up that hand. Throws up that hand. And I believe that. I believe when you need it, God will give it to you, even unto death. Because who, who's sufficient for these things? Who can do this stuff? But I don't, I don't never want to be terrorized by my enemies. Because Bible, the true terror is God. Uh, what does that verse say? Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. If, any, if every Christian should understand the terror of the Lord, realize that nobody could... <laughs> you want to be terrorized? Well, God can do the terrorizing. But they're, they're small potatoes compared to what God can do. And that's so we shouldn't be terrorized by them. We shouldn't be fearful of them. Um, if you're in perfect fellowship with God, you won't have any fear at all. Uh, before you cash in, consider the cost. And that is, who else loses besides you? How many will be lost uh, or will not hear because of you? Um, to glorify God in life, yeah. But you may glorify Him in death. What a testimony that is. Though, listen, that Fox's Book of Martyrs has been, outside of the Bible, probably the greatest Christian book ever written. Because it tells of the testimony of thousands that endured unto death. Torture, and uh, any, everything, you know, banishment. You wouldn't believe the things they've been put through. And they endured all that for the Lord. And you know what that does? That bolsters your faith. That bolsters your, your confidence in the Lord. That you can get through it. Uh, Romans 14, verse 7 and 8 says, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Romans 10, 14 says, How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? How shall they hear or believe on him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Well, let me tell you something. You're preaching the loudest when they're persecuting you, and you're maintaining the faith. And the last one is this. Before you lose it, latch on to the fact that you can't. What are you going to lose? If this, if, if, if this government turns on you, takes everything you have, exactly what are they taking? What are you losing? You're not losing your life. You have eternal life. I mean, the things you have down here, they're all going to burn anyway. You already know that. They can't take the word out of your heart, the song that's there, the love you have for God, the love you have for your family and your, and your, uh, your, your brothers and sisters in Christ. What are they, what are they going to take? You can't take anything. You need to keep that in mind. And as far as this other stuff, it's just junk anyway. Romans 10, 28 I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. They just do not have that kind of power. I mean, even if they could, even if, if, even if they could force you through drugs and all kinds of things to recant, it still wouldn't work. <laughs> the Lord still got you. So you can't lose your salvation, you can't lose your home in heaven. Uh, about the only thing you could lose, and that'd be by choice, would be some rewards that you would have had coming. That's about the only thing. A Christian can lose rewards because, well, he decides it's just not worth it. I think as long as you stay in that book, as long as you stay close to the Lord, you'll get through this fine. We'll get through this fine. 
And um, if the Lord tarries, however long He decides to tarry, is however long we have to endure it. And we will get through it. And we will get through it victoriously because of Him. I'm not relying on myself, not one minute. Not one minute. I put no confidence in the arm of flesh. None. But I can put confidence in Him. So, before you panic, give the Lord a chance. Send up a prayer. Spend some time with Him. Open up the book. Quote a few verses. There's a lot of things you can do before you throw in the towel. Let's all stand. All right, doesn't look like uh, she's back just yet, but she will be shortly, so we can fellowship.